celebrating Easter. We're celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. Amen? Hallelujah. This morning, I pray that you'll be blessed in this message that the Lord gave me. We're going to look at the resurrection today, but we're going to look at the resurrection just a little differently than I think we normally would, perhaps with just a little different twist to it this morning. And I believe you're really going to be blessed as we do. So if you have the word with you this morning, let's go to Romans chapter 6. And we're going to start in verse 1 today. Romans chapter 6 and verse 1. Hallelujah. We're going to give you a moment to get there on this Resurrection Sunday. Hallelujah. 2018. A new beginning in the Lord. Hallelujah. How many are believing the Lord for a new beginning today? You know, we were in praise and worship today, and I was just talking to the Lord. And the Lord reminded me of the Jewish menorah, which was an article that was in the tabernacle of the Lord and then the temple of the Lord. And as we know, the Jewish menorah has six candle stands coming out of one main stand. And six is the number of man. But six plus one, the center stand of the menorah, represents Jesus, amen? Six plus one equals seven. Seven is the number of completion in the Hebrew. But I heard the Lord say today, six plus one equals seven, plus the resurrection equals eight, which is the number of new beginnings. What is the resurrection of Christ? It's a new beginning, It's a new beginning for each and every one of us. Can I hear an amen? We've got to understand that today. The resurrection of Christ means that we could have something, we could be something, we could become something that we never could before. Do you believe that today? Why? Because of what Christ did for us, the resurrection was our new beginning in him. Now, I want you to see something this morning that's fascinating. Paul wrote this in Romans chapter 6 and verse 1, and let's stand this morning to honor the Word of God. The book of Romans really, I believe, is about Paul's deliverance, is about his struggle that he went through to be set free in the Lord. And I believe he made it through that struggle and found his new beginning in Christ. Can I hear an amen? Delivered and then became the super apostle that God called him to be. Can I hear an amen? But I want you to notice what he said in the midst of his deliverance. He says in Romans 6, 1, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. He said, We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus. Now how many here in this place were baptized in the Jesus? Can I hear an amen? Baptism is really a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Because when we receive the Lord Jesus as Savior, which is much like a couple getting engaged... Many times that's done privately, it's just between the two, the couple. But then later, they're going to have a public declaration that they love each other and that they're going to be with each other for the rest of their lives in the name of Jesus. When we look at that, that's really a picture of how baptism works. We get saved and it's us and Jesus, but then we're going to have a public declaration of our love for him. And that we want to be with him for eternity. That's called baptism. And baptism really is a picture that we who we were go down into the waters or the grave and we die. And we're raised up in newness of life in Christ. Isn't that a beautiful picture? So Paul says we are baptized into Christ. Verse 3, or don't you know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? So Paul is relating baptism to death. It's about dying and then being raised to newness of life. Amen? Verse 4, were we therefore buried with him through baptism into death 
in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. <coughs> Somebody say amen. And we know that word life in the Greek and Aramaic translates zoe, which means wholeness in your spirit, soul, and body. Not just a part of you being saved, but all of you being saved. Not just a part of you being delivered, but all of you being delivered. Not just a little bit of you being resurrected, all of you being resurrected. Can I hear an amen? Somebody in the house say Zoe. So notice verse 5. If we've been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection for we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with or in the hebrew that the body of sin might be rendered powerless at that at that point so that we would no longer be slaves to sin because anyone who has died has been freed from sin now if we died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. For we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. Hallelujah. Let's be seated this morning. How many are excited about Jesus? Amen? Hallelujah. <clears throat> this morning we're celebrating the resurrection of Christ. And as I was studying this week, I really began to focus on the resurrection of the Lord. And do I really understand the power of the resurrection of God? And one of the things that the Lord always does is He takes me back to the common dictionary. And what does a particular word mean? In the dictionary so I looked up the word resurrection and resurrection in the standard English dictionary literally is the state of one being risen from the dead now that English definition literally points back to Christianity and it points to Christ's death and resurrection at the cross can I hear an amen but if you take a look at the word resurrection in the Hebrew, it means something completely different. The word resurrection in the Hebrew literally means rebirth, revival, resistance, and uprising or rising up. It's interesting that the word resurrection in the Hebrew has nothing to do with death. If you really study it, it has nothing to do with death. It means rebirth, revival, resistance, and uprising. Can I hear an amen? Which meant what? When we look at the resurrection, the resurrection isn't really about Christ's death. It's about Christ overcoming death and being victorious on the cross, meaning that through his resurrection, rebirth is possible for us. Revival is possible for us. Resisting the enemy is possible for us. And rising up to a whole new dimension in him is available to us. Somebody please say amen. And as we look at this, God reminded me as I was studying yesterday, he reminded me that he loves to do things in threes. God loves to do things in threes. We know God himself is tripartite. He is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Can I hear an amen? He created us tripartite. We are spirit, soul, and body. But God reminded me this weekend that there's really three stages for each and every one of us whether we're lost or whether we're saved. There's three stages for each and every one of us. It's the womb, it's life, and it's eternity. It's the womb, it's life, and it's eternity. Can I hear an amen? That's a process or a progression. Can I hear an amen this morning? 
Now I want you to notice something today. If we go to 1 John chapter 5. 1 John chapter 5, and I just want to remind us of the tripartite heart and mind of God and what he's thinking as he's leading us through this process. In 1 John chapter 5, I want you to notice what the word says in verses 7 and 8. Actually, let's do this. Let's start in verse 6. So 1 John chapter 5 and verse 6. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And what does the Word say? And the three are in agreement. How many know today that we need to get in agreement with the three? Can I hear an amen? Amen. We need to get in agreement, hallelujah, with the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And when we get in agreement with the Spirit and the water and the blood, what are we coming in agreement with? That the resurrection of Jesus is a new beginning for us. A point of transformation for us. It's an opportunity for rebirth, revival, resistance, and uprising for every single one of us. And I hear an amen. But we need to remember this is a three-part process. The womb, daily life, and eternity is the progression that every human being will ever go through. Jesus himself went through a three-part progression. We could argue he went from womb to life to eternity. But he also went from death into the grave and hell And then in the resurrection. Can I hear an amen? Again, tripartite. But one of the things that I believe God wants us to really do today is to begin to get a real revelation of what the resurrection really means. So today I'm not going to talk about Mary at the tomb. And I'm not going to talk about the angels and the folded burial cloth. I want to talk about the power of resurrection in our lives. Can I hear an amen? It fascinates me as we study the Word of God. If we really get God's perspective from the Word and what life is all about, we're really going to find that birth and death are really the same thing. They're mirrors of each other. Let me say that again. When we really begin to understand the Word of God and the heart of God in the way God sees things, birth and and death are really the same thing. They mirror each other. It's very interesting as we study the Word, the Word tells us to do some things towards birth and death that kind of seem countercultural. If we study the Word, the, really, the Word really says that when a child is born, we should cry. And the Word says, and we should rejoice when they depart. Doesn't make a whole lot of sense, does it? Until you become a parent. How many know that I believe the word says that we should cry when a child is born because it's probably a picture of what that child's going to put us through. Can I hear an amen? And then as that child is saved and pursues the Lord and fulfills the Lord's purpose in his or her generation, Death really isn't something that we should mourn. It's something that we should celebrate. Can I hear an amen? It's something that we should rejoice in the Lord. So we've got to understand that in the Lord, departure is really a birth. It's really a birthing. Birthing and death are twins. But this is what we have to understand. In the English language, we don't really understand the word or the true spiritual significance of the word death. And I want you to listen to me with this because this is so important. If I can get you to get this nugget of rhema in the Lord, your outlook on this whole message and even on your life is going to begin to change. In our culture, we really believe that death is cessation of life. That's really what we believe. That's how we see death. 
as cessation or ending of life. But if we really understand what the Word of God says about death in the Greek and in Hebrew and in the Aramaic, we understand this. True death is separation from God. That's what death really is. Death is separation from God. So there's really one true death. And that's for those that are going to go to hell and be separated from God for eternity. So we've got to understand that when a believer dies, they really didn't die. They just passed on into the next dimension or the next segment of God's plan for them. Can I hear an amen? Because we will see them again. We will be with them for eternity. They didn't cease to live. They really now are starting to live. Are you hearing this in the Lord? So we've got to understand this. Death for the believer is really graduation. It's moving on to the next level in the Lord. The next progression in him. What's that progression? The womb, then life, then eternity. The only ones that experience true death are the ones that reject Jesus and will burn in hell for all of eternity, separated from God. Tell me that's not what death is. Tell me that's not what death is. We've got to understand this as God's people. And as God's people, if we can begin to understand this, we can begin to understand some of the things that are going on in our life right now. At the moment of conception, when the sperm meets the egg, hallelujah, and that embryo begins to then form in the womb of the mother, that's stage one. Can I hear an amen? That's stage one. That's where life really begins and we need to understand that as God's people and I believe if we do that's going to be one of the reasons why we stand against abortion because I believe life begins at conception I believe that that embryo is not just a biped mammalian bundle of id as the word the world would describe it I believe the word would say that's life can I hear an amen hallelujah but the baby in the womb I want us to understand this, only understands one world, and it's the world of the womb. And in the womb, the baby eats. In the womb, the baby grows. In the womb, the baby experiences the mother's heartbeat. In the womb is where the baby feels safe and comfortable and protected. Can I hear an amen? But how many know around the point of nine months, that baby's about to outgrow the womb? Let me say that again. How many know that about at nine months, that baby is going to outgrow the womb only even though it's the only world or home that it's ever known? Soon, it must die to that world so that it can go into another. Can I hear an amen? Soon it's got to die to that world and go into another. If the baby stays in the womb, once it gets to the point where it's ready for the next world, the next phase, the next season, if it stays in the womb, it will die. God designed it so the mother's body and the womb and the baby know when it's time. When is it time? When the labor pains begin. When is it time? When the water breaks. When is it time? It's when she taps husband in the middle of the night and says, we got to go. It's time. We got to go. Now, how many know if at that point the baby stays in the womb, the baby's going to die? That's why in the Lord, we don't want to get stuck in a season. When God says it's time to go to the next season, the next realm, the next dimension, we've got to be willing to move forward into it. And by the way, it always happens with labor. 
There's always pain. There's always difficulty. There's always challenge. The baby doesn't realize it the, as the water of life that's been around it exits the womb. And now it begins to get uncomfortable. It doesn't realize that it's about to go down the birth canal. Now, I don't know what I was thinking when I was going down my mother's birth canal, but it was probably not the most pleasant experience in the world. Why wasn't it? Because I've been used to one place, I'm now in a transitional place, and I'm going to a whole other place I've never been before. Birth, life, eternity. We've got to trust God in every phase. Can I hear an amen? And then that baby comes down, and God designed it so the baby comes into the world upside down. Tell me that's not uncomfortable. When Hannah was born, Hannah's sitting in the front row here. When she was born, I was there in the delivery room. I didn't think I was going to be, be able to handle it. By the grace of God, I was. And I'll never forget hearing the doctor say, she's crowning. She's crowning. And I'm looking away. And, and my, my former wife says to me, you got to look. You got to look. I said, I can't. I can't. She says, you got to look. I says, I can't. And finally, in a voice that made me think she needed deliverance, she said, you need to look. Yes, ma'am. So at that particular point, I looked, and we were past crowning, and entire, Hannah's entire head was coming out of a piece of my former wife's anatomy that I didn't expect a head to be coming forth from. And Hannah's red and gray and covered in stuff, and I'm thinking this cannot be an incredible experience for her. In the moment she's out of the womb, smack, rah, and she starts crying. How many know so many times in the Lord we transition that way? In the next season, I mean, there's pain and there's labor and it's messy. And he may have to put a little spank in there to get us breathing in the next realm. But here's the thing. I'm convinced today that something was impossible for Hannah even in the midst of the miracle of life that I was witnessing. And that was as I held her in my arms after I snipped the cord. And I held her and I remember thinking to myself, I want to protect her against everything in this world that could ever hurt her or wound her. I had no idea at the time of the things that were coming. But I'm convinced of this, that she could not look at me at that point and say, Dad, I want to go back. Dad, I want to go back. Do you remember when Nicodemus came to the Lord? And Nicodemus, the Pharisee, comes by night. And he says, Lord, what must I do to be born again? What must I do? Do I, do I have to, you, you keep talking about this born again. You keep talking about this rebirth. Can I crawl back into my mother's womb and be born again? How many know the answer is no? But that birthing is in the physical. Rebirthing or being born again is in the supernatural where we die with Christ and we're raised with him in newness of life. Can I hear an amen? We've got to begin to realize in the Lord to be absent from one realm is to be present in another. Let me say that again. To be absent from one realm is to be present in another, which means once you leave the womb, you don't need the womb any longer. Once God takes you out of a season, you don't need that season any longer. You need the next season. Don't look back. Don't smell the wine cork. Don't grieve. Don't mourn. Move forward. God made every part of you to move forward in the newness of life. Your feet point forward. Your eyes look forward. Your hands grasp forward. God made you to move forward. No baby's ever going to look at mom and say, I want to go back in the womb. Why? Because if it was even possible, they'd die there. 
Because the umbilical cord is gone. The water of the womb is gone. The past is gone. It's behind us. We don't realize what Jesus gave up to come and live and die for our sake. Do you know that when Jesus came, everything changed for him? We've got to understand this. He left the beautiful, secure womb of heaven itself and was birthed violently into the earth into a plan that the Father created for him that would ultimately lead to his crushing, his wounding, his bruising. I mean, think about this. Not only that, when he left heaven, he was not going to return to heaven the same way that he left heaven. His relationship with the Father was forever changed. We've got to understand this. Just like a son that leaves the father's house to go and marry the bride in the Hebrew culture and then brings the bride back to the father's house to the wing of the house that he's created for his wife. He doesn't return the same way that he left. He's different. He's now married. The two have become one flesh. He's not what he was when he left. He's been changed, metamorphosized, grown up, and new. And when Jesus returned back to heaven with the keys to death and hell in his hands, he returned back with all power and all authority given to him he returned with nail scars he returned the victorious king the darling of heaven became the king of kings you see he'd gone through a season and he was no longer the same and what did Paul say do you want your template here it is I died with Christ I'm raised with Christ, and I'm no longer what I was. And if there is anyone that would grieve and mourn over the womb of the past, it would have been Paul. Because in Paul's past, he was the Pharisee of Pharisees. He was the Jew of Jews. He was the lawyer of lawyers. He had a secure government job, and he also murdered a bunch of the new church called The Way. If there's anybody that would grieve and mourn over the past and try to make sense of it and get stuck with it, it was Paul. But Paul realized in his deliverance in the book of Romans, he had to have a new mindset. And the new mindset was the past was behind and he couldn't go back. He died with Christ. He raised a new creation. And now he can only be what God designed him to be in the new season. There is no going back, there is no giving up, and there was no retreat. Retreat back into your mother's womb. Go for it. I don't even want to think about that one. It's not possible. But yet we get in the midst of the birthing and the travail of going into the next season. And we want to hold on desperately like the baby holding on to mom's womb not wanting to let go. And so the Lord says, okay, shoom, I'll give you a little bit of help with that. Those labor pains are literally pushing that baby out. Literally, the contraction in the mom is pushing that baby into the next season. The contraction of the Spirit are going on right now in the church, and God is birthing us into a new season. We've got to understand this in the Lord. Can I hear an Amen. See, we've got to see this for what it's worth. Let me say this again. To be absent from one realm is to be present in another. See, here's the thing. When the enemy sent Jesus to the cross, when the Jewish leaders cooperated with the demonic plan, which was actually really God's plan when we look at it, the true plan, but they didn't realize it. I'm convinced in my mind that that high priest 
that put his scepter up to Jesus' face while Jesus was being crucified and mocked him and ridiculed him thought the same thing that Satan thought at that moment. And that was, death was Jesus' end. But what he didn't realize was, death is separation from God. And Jesus would never be separated from God. What Satan didn't realize was that death was simply a rebirthing into a new season for Jesus. And the season that sealed Satan's fate forever. Jesus rebirthing, Jesus moving into the new season literally brought Satan's death. Not Jesus' death. Because it meant Satan was going to be separated from God for eternity in the place where the fire never goes out and the worm never dies. Do you get it, church? He didn't realize what he was doing. That's why the Word says if he had realized that he wouldn't have put Christ on the cross. But he saw death the wrong way. We put him on the cross, it's over. No, we put him on the cross and it's just begun. It's a rebirthing, a revival, a renewal, a new season. And every time Jesus puts you on the cross and you feel like you're dying, it's really a rebirthing and a revival and a new season. Does anybody get this in the Lord? Is anybody understanding? Can I hear an amen? So if we're risen with Christ, we need to begin to seek the things that are above. No longer the things that were below. Can I hear an amen? In Deuteronomy 28, the word says, When we honor God, we'll live as the head and not the tail. We'll live above and not beneath. What's beneath? Your life prior to salvation. What's above? The heavenly life that God now has for you in this earth. Can I hear an amen? Somebody say, soon and very soon we're going to see the king. Amen. Hallelujah. What did what did Jesus say to Nicodemus? He said, you must be born again. What is that? To pass from life into a whole other dimension in Christ. Can I hear an amen? That's the heart of the Lord. This is just a place of gestation, of growth, of growing up, of moving forward. That's what this life is. Do you know, I find it interesting that many times in Jesus' earthly ministry, including at the triumphal entry, they tried to forcefully make him king. They also tried to kill him on multiple occasions. But they tried to forcibly make him king. And I believe that one of the enemy's greatest efforts to try to get him off track was when he entered into Jerusalem and triumphal entries over Passover week. They believed that there were three to six million Jews in Jerusalem in that Passover week. And they're laying down palm branches. Palm branches were laid down for a king. Jesus is riding in on on a donkey. Kings, including David and his sons, rode on donkeys. And they're crying out, Hosanna, son of David. They are quoting messianic prophecy. Tell me the heart of Jesus didn't begin to long and to yearn at that point. Remember, he was the God-man. Son of God, Son of Man. He fulfilled man's side of the covenant. He fulfilled God's side of the covenant. Can I hear an amen? Tell me the man's side of his heart didn't think, wow, this would be amazing, wouldn't it? Let's bypass death. Let's set up an earthly kingdom. And let's rule and reign here. But see, here's the problem. Jesus knew in his heart he had to go through everything the father planned for him in that season to get to the next and the next season was where he would be the triumphant king if jesus had chosen to stay in that season he was in on that palm sunday the plan would have died 
because it was the Father's plan that he would die. You see, if you stay in the season that you're in, when God says it's time to go, you'll die in that season. Just like the baby will die in the womb. Is anybody getting this? See, for Jesus to walk in everything the Father had put within him, he had to go through the cross. And if you're going to get to what Jesus has for you, you have to go through the cross. And you may die to everything you ever wanted and thought you'd be, but it's not death, separation from God. It's a rebirthing, a renewal, a revival, an uprising. Can I hear an amen? But just like Jesus, our template, you've got to descend before you ascend. We've got to go down in the grave before we can rise up again. That's the beautiful picture of baptism. Can I hear an amen? But there are some in the church that die in the womb. You can meet them 10 years from now and they're still having the same conversations. They're still talking about the same services 20 years back. They're still talking about a 15-year-old encounter with God. They're still there. They're stuck in the womb and they're dead and they don't realize it. What's the sign that you're stuck in the womb and you're dying? You're always focusing on what was. But when you're in the new season in the Lord, it's marked by two things. You're in preparation for what is to come. Come on now. You're in preparation for what is to come. And you're looking forward to what he's promised. Not looking back and saying, oh, do you remember in the 1970s? Do you remember in the 1980s? Do you remember this revival? Do you remember that revival? Do you remember this? Do you remember that? And they're stuck. They died there and they didn't know it. Now the body's still breathing, but there's no fight left in them. And they're a ping pong ball that Satan's going cha-ching, 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 cha-ching. They got a birth into the new season. It's wonderful what God did at Toronto. But Toronto is in the 90s. It's 2018. God's got a new thing that he's doing. And by the way, it's better than Toronto. Why? Because he saves the best wine for last. Get out of the Toronto revival of your life. And move forward. There's going to be pain. There's going to be labor. It's going to be messy. It's not going to be pretty. But when you get into the new season and begin breathing fresh air, it's a rebirthing in the Lord. And nothing else compares to it. Can I hear an amen? Is anybody getting excited about the Lord? My Bible says today is the day of salvation. Not yesterday. Today is the day of salvation. Can I hear an amen? So you know what I'm convinced we need to do? We need to bring our dark clothes to a birthing and our dancing clothes to the funeral. Let me say it again. I am convinced if this thing is done God's way that we bring our mourning clothes to the birthing. And we bring, hallelujah, our dancing clothes to the funeral. Because the funeral for the believer isn't death any more than the grave was death for Jesus. It was a new beginning. So at a funeral, the only thing that we should be mourning is that we're still back here in this season. <laughs> let's not mourn for them. Let's mourn for us. I want it! I want the new season! Jesus says, but there's more for you here yet. Can I hear an amen?
Which brings me to a point, you don't transition seasons because you want to transition seasons. You transition seasons because God leads you to it. And if you won't go with the leading of the gentle shepherd, then he'll bring Nebuchadnezzar and you can try the fiery furnace. Can I hear an amen? <laughs> but don't worry, don't worry, even in the fiery furnace, your ropes are going to burn off and you're going to meet the one looking like the son of man there. Amen. So pastor, what are you trying to say? You can't lose in Christ. Is what I'm saying. Try. Paul says, I lost my life, but I gained. Like the famous martyred missionary Jim Elliot once said, he is no fool who gives that which he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. Can I hear an amen? So what do we need to do? We need to realize, number one, when God says it's time to go into the new season, it's time to go. But we've also got to realize that in the present season, we've got to be cooperating with the Holy Spirit, moving at the leading of God, surrendering to God's preparation and sanctification and deliverance. Because what God's wanting to do in this season is as important as what he wants to do in the next season. In fact, I argue if you don't let God do what God wants to do in this season, you're not going to make it to the next season. You're going to die in the womb. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I've met people that when God starts talking about the new season, they immediately completely in their heart abandon the season they're in. Even when God is saying, no, that season is down the road a couple years. No, it's now. Let's go. You're not ready to go yet. You're ready when the labor pains start. The Lord was ready when the beating started. How did Jesus know it was time to, to go into the next season? It was when the labor started. When did the labor start with the cat of nine tails and the crown of thorns? That's when the labor, the travail started. Can I hear an amen? But what was happening in the season for Jesus prior, hallelujah, to his resurrection? The gospel was coming forth from him. Now that word gospel is a very interesting word. That word gospel, if we take it to the Greek and Aramaic in which the time Jesus was walking in his earthly ministry, the gospel literally comes from a Greek word called evangelium, which is where we get our term evangelism. And it literally means the good news. The good news. And Jesus went about from village to village preaching the good news. That's the gospel. How many know in his earthly ministry he was living the gospel? Now stay with me. What's God doing in this season in your life right now? He's writing the gospel of Stonecliff. He's writing the gospel of Van Berger. He's writing the gospel of Knauer. He's writing the gospel of Wardell. He's writing the good news of your life in this season. Can I hear an amen? That's what he's doing. You're learning his truth. You're understanding his word. You're going through sanctification. You are being processed for the new season in the Lord. Can I hear an amen? Don't get so fired up about this message about the resurrection in the next season that you get so ready to go that you forfeit the remainder of what he wants to do in this season. Can I hear an amen? we got to be in tune with the Spirit in this stuff. Let me show you a verse that I think is going to blow you away. Let's go to 1 John chapter 4 and verse 17. You may still have that practically opened if you haven't shut your Bible yet. Let's go to 1 John chapter 4 and let's go to verse 17. I'm sorry. Let's go to verse 
Yep, 17, right on with that, thinking about the Lord and blowing the verse there. The word says this, In this way, love is made complete among us so that we may have confidence on the day of judgment because in this world we are like him. Now, Cindy, can you show that to us in the King James? Please take a look at the screen because I want to make sure that you get this. Now notice this passage, 1 John 4, 17, in the King James. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. I want you to notice something. The word doesn't say, as he was. The word says, as he is. Let me read it again. Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we. Let me ask you a question. The book of 1 John, was it written before the resurrection or after? So as Jesus was, was his earthly ministry. As Jesus is, is the resurrected, triumphant king. And what does Paul say? Or I'm sorry, what does John say? He says, as Jesus is now, so should you be in this world. Meaning, we should be walking as kings. If he said, you need to be as he was... I'd be a little disappointed, even though that's still amazing. He says, no, you walk as he is in this world. What is he? Present tense, resurrected, seating at the right hand of the Father, reigning and ruling as king, coming back for his people. We are to be as he is. That's why Jesus said at the end of his Gospels, he said, and these signs are going to follow those who believe. In my name, they're going to heal the sick. They're going to raise the dead. They're going to cast out demons. They're going to preach the gospel to the end of the earth. Why? Because they're going to live not as I was, but as I am now. Do you want a message from the Lord today? Stop living as you were. Start living now as you're supposed to be. As he is in this world. Woo! Woo! Did anybody just get some rhema? Hallelujah. Stop living as you were. Start living now as who you really are. And that is died with him, rose with him, reigning with him. That's why the word says you'll walk as the head and not the tail. You'll walk above and not beneath. You'll be something you never could be before. If you're still living as you were, you're not in the season of the is. He's the God who was and is and is to come. Where are we at right now in history? We're in the is. What's the is? As he is, so are we in the world. Somebody say you're getting something from this in the Lord. I mean, we got to see this. Stop living like you were. Start living like you are to be. As he is in this world, so are we. Meaning that we're to walk in the attributes, the character, the traits, the power of the resurrected Christ. Not as some worm just barely saved, hanging on a thread above the pit of hell, like a sinner in the hands of the angry God. You are saved. You are redeemed. Your name's written in the book of life. You're being sanctified. Let's start living as he is. If you don't get excited about this, I'm going to put the pulpit out on Windsor. And I'm going to preach this from Windsor if we don't get excited. I'll preach it in the middle of the road if that's what it takes to get excited. I mean, come on, church. Let's see this thing for what it is. Can I hear an amen in the world? Not like he was, as he is, the resurrected Jesus is how we're supposed to be. Which means what? We're to be a people that live above and not beneath. 
The head and not the tail, which means what? There's just some conversations that I shouldn't be in anymore. There's just some mindsets that I need to be taken captive. There's just some thought processes that I need to say, I'm above you now. There's just some limitations we need to start saying, you don't have me anymore. There's some mountains that we should start saying, you need to move. Why? Because I died with him, and I was resurrected with him, and I'm now as he is in this world. Is anybody getting this? Do you know what's really happened in my life? I went from being a chicken to being an eagle. I went from being a rooster to being an eagle. See, we've got to understand this. The most majestic bird talked about in the word of God is the eagle and whenever God references the eagle in the word the eagle is always referenced as rising above and not falling beneath the eagle is the bird that God created to soar above the violent winds of the storm when the storm breaks loose. You don't find an eagle down in the storm. You find an eagle soaring above the storm. And the way God created the eagle. God created the eagle with a special inner eyelid. That when one of the, the eagle's few predators. Is chasing it to try to kill it. That eagle can fly straight into the sun by opening that inner eyelid. It's the only bird that can do it. It can fly straight into the sun until its predator breaks off pursuits. You know what that means for us if we're going to live like he is in this world? That when the storms come like an eagle, we rise above them. When the enemy's chasing us, we just fly into the sun. You know how amazing that eagle is, if I can use some very common terminology right now in this message? You know, most birds, when they procreate, they procreate on earth. One of the only birds that we know of that procreates in the air is the eagle. In fact, now follow me on this one. Eagles procreate at 20,000 feet, researchers tell us. And what happens is the male and female eagles, now watch this illustration if you will please. The male and female eagle fly towards each other and they meet and they go upward into the air and they intertwine. When they intertwine, they wrap themselves around each other and start a death plunge. And they plunge from 20,000 feet in the air, intertwined while they reproduce. And before they hit the ground, they separate, spread their wings. And an eagle has up to a six-foot wingspan. After they procreate, they, go, they release each other, they spread their wings, and they soar again. What is this picture? It's the cross. See, out of death comes life. Satan saw Calvary and he said, it's the end. Jesus saw Calvary and said, it's the beginning! Is anybody seeing this? In those eagles, every time they procreate, risk death in order to reproduce. See, the, the more you're willing to die, the greater fruit you're going to bear for Christ. In this season, that is. Can I hear an Amen. Jesus, the greatest eagle in the word of God, said this. Let's go to John chapter 12. How many are enjoying this message in the Lord? 
Well, Pastor, I came today for the empty tomb. I came today for Mary, and I came today for Peter, and I came today for the traditional message. I'm as sick and tired as the, of the traditional as you should be. Let's start moving into the rhema of God. Can I hear it? Amen. You've heard enough traditional Resurrection Day messages. You need the rhema today. You need the manna today. You need to know what God is saying today. Can I hear an amen? I want you to have a now message, not a was message. Amen. How can I preach to you about being in the now and then give you a message that's in the was? I'm contradicting myself. I can't do it. Can I hear an amen? Now, I want you to see something in the Word. John chapter 12 and verse 20, the Word of God says this. Now, there were some Greeks among them who went to worship at the feast. I find it interesting that there were even Greeks that were converting to Judaism at this time. Now, there were some Greeks among them who went to worship at the feast. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew, and Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. But what did Jesus say? The hour has not yet come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Isn't that an interesting response? What was Jesus really saying? I'm called first to the Jews and then to the Greeks. Who is going to reach the Greeks for the kingdom? Paul. And Jesus himself was not going to jump into the work that he had delegated for another man to do. Is anybody getting this? Jesus understood the season. Can I hear an amen? Hallelujah. So notice what the word says in John 12, verse 23. Verse 23. Jesus replied, the hour has not yet come for the Son of Man to be glorified. He wouldn't see them, the Word says. But I tell you the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. The man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it, for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, my servant will also be. My father will honor the one who serves me. Now my heart is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. What did Jesus just give us? The template for our life. What did he say? Unless a seed will grow into the ground, go into the ground and die, it doesn't become anything more than what it is. But if a kernel or a seed will go into the ground and die, what happens in the ground? It's cut off from the sunlight. It's covered with moisture. And it begins to change. Kind of sounds like the womb, doesn't it? <laughs> but instead of being birthed out of the womb, that seed does what? The hard outer shell breaks off and new life comes out of it. You know what Jesus says? This is what your death and resurrection look like. You go into the ground with me and die, and you come back up again, something you could never be before, and it multiplies for the sake of the kingdom. And what did Jesus say? Shall I say, Father, take this from me? No, it's for this very reason that I'm here. When are we going to start saying that in the is season? When we start going through things, instead of getting angry and upset with God and wanting to quit and wanting to give up, why don't we start saying, it's for this very reason that I'm here. It's for this very hour that I'm here. 
and everything that I'm going through is killing this outer shell so that Christ can come forth from me. Well, Pastor, I didn't come here today for that kind of message. Well, praise God, you're getting it anyway. Can I hear an amen? See, we've got to see this for what it is. It's going somewhere. This is going somewhere. You are going somewhere. You might be in a season of buffering, but you're going somewhere. I want you to see something in Matthew 28. All of this is for a purpose. Go to Matthew 28. I want you to see something. Matthew 28 is Matthew's description of the resurrection. But I want you to see something that maybe you've never seen before. If you'll give me just a few more moments of your time, I want you to see something that I really believe is going to bless you in the Lord. Can I hear an amen? Jesus has resurrected. The guards have been paid off. And I want you to see something that the Word says. Matthew 28 and verse 16. After all this had happened, Matthew records the fact that Jesus told them to go somewhere and wait. That after he died, to go somewhere and wait. Who remembers the Wednesday evening service from two weeks ago? Who remembers the message from that service? What was it? It was going up the mountain. Can I hear an amen? Notice Matthew chapter 28 and verse 16. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain that Jesus told them to go to. What do you do after your resurrection? You go up the mountain. See, every time you transition into the next season, you're going up the mountain. Can I hear an amen? The way I see it in the Word of God, there's two pur- actually three purposes for a mountain. Purpose number one, you go there to get a revelation of God. Purpose number two, you speak to it in faith and it moves. Purpose number three, you climb it! And by the way, most of the time the revelation doesn't come until you climb it. <laughs> Because the revelation's at the top, not at the bottom. Where did Moses get the Ten Commandments? At the top of the mountain. Where did Jesus transfigure? At the top of the mountain. Where do we get revelation from God? At the top of the mountain. Why? Because the atmosphere at the top of the mountain is completely different than the atmosphere at the bottom of the mountain. You've been living in the bottom of the mountain atmosphere. It's time to go up. But you got to give up to go up. You got to grow up to go up. You got to die to go up. Is anybody receiving this in the Lord? You get excited about that mountain, but you're going to die on the way up. Mountains are there for revelation, they're there for moving, and they're there for climbing. Can I hear an amen? You're not going to be the same at the top of the mountain as you were at the bottom. Hallelujah. I want to close with this real quick. How many have been enjoying this message in the Lord? Isn't this fun? Hallelujah. This is as close to traditional as I'm going to get in this message. Three things about the cross and the resurrection that we need to really understand. Because if we do, they're going to change our life, okay? Number one, (laughs) what's the historical connection for us to Calvary and to the resurrection? We need to understand this. Well, today, just a little bit, we're going to take communion. What a great way to wrap up the resurrection morning service. We're going to take communion. When we take communion, I'm going to lead you through a passage that Paul wrote in the book of Corinthians where the Lord is going to reference, or he's going to reference in the Lord, the Lord's Supper. 
And we're going to talk about the Lord's body and the Lord's blood. We've got to realize that the cross and the resurrection have powerful personal relevance for us because it's where Jesus' body was broken and his blood was shed for our sake. Which means what? When the enemy comes to you and says to you, you're worthless, you need to say back to him, that's a lie because I am of such great worth that Jesus died for my sin and rose again so I could be with him for all of eternity. Now the other night, after service, I believe it was Friday night after service, Cindy was just playing some videos. And in the videos that Cindy was playing, we saw a video from one of the churches in Dallas, Texas that we really, really like. If I said the name, you'd know exactly what I'm talking about. I'm just saying, just have these music videos that we really, really like. And at the end of one of these videos, one of the girls that was singing on the altar said, during this song, God gave me a vision. And she said, in the vision, I saw Jesus on the cross. And she said, I looked around and I was the only one there. And she said, I looked at Jesus and I said, stop, stop, Jesus. I'm the only one here, stop. And Jesus looked at her and said, I have to do this for your sake. She said, but I'm the only one here. I'm not worth it. Stop. And he said, you're worth everything to me. I would have died even if it was only for you because you're that precious to me. That's the personal relevance of the cross and the resurrection. We understand that if Jesus stayed in the grave, we'd be done today. We might as well be like any of the other religions of the earth who had a central figure who claimed to be something but died, and that was it. Are you hearing me? I mean, we'd be just like those that follow Buddha or Muhammad or any of those other religions. I mean, we can go find Buddha in the grave today. We can go find Muhammad, but we can't find Jesus because <laughs> he's not in the grave any longer. I mean, I once read an article where an atheist said to a Christian, you know what the problem is with your religion? And he said, what? And the atheist said, it's based on an empty tomb. Hallelujah! Yes, it is! Because if there was a body in the tomb, we'd be in trouble. Because then everything Jesus said wasn't. <laughs> Amen? That's the personal side of the cross and the resurrection from us. What else is there for us? Well, what does that mean for us today then? I've got the history and what he did for me, but what does that mean now that I'm supposed to do because of that? That's Romans 6, 1 through 7 that we read at the beginning of the, the message today. We've got to die with him and rise up with him. Can I hear an amen? Not only did Jesus have to carry a cross, so do you. Brent in Friday night's message gave us a visual image that stayed with me. And that was Friday morning, Good Friday. He was heading to work. He was headed north to Beloit. And in McChesney Park was a group of believers carrying a cross down the road. And you look at it and go, wow, that's really cool. Until he said the rest of what he saw. He said there were some fellows carrying this very large cross and then behind them was a large group of people drinking Starbucks coffee. They had their water with them. They had their coffee with them. And they're just talking and walking down the road. Do you know what that's a picture of? The church today. There's a remnant carrying the cross, the cross of Christ. And behind them are a bunch of folks drinking coffee and talking. It's a picture of the church today. You got some folks in the front, sold out, remnant, going after him, carrying the cross. And then you got a bunch of donut-eating, eating Starbucks, drinking folks behind them that are just on the seeker journey. 
And I tell you what, when the going gets tough, that group behind is going to start fading away if they don't join the group that's carrying the cross. Church, Jesus has a cross just your size. <laughs> one size fits all doesn't work with Jesus. He's got one that's just your size. And he wants you to die on it so that he might live. But the only thing is, really as a believer, you'll never die. <laughs> because death is is separation from God. You're not going to experience that. You know what you're going to do on the cross? You're going to metamorphosize. The caterpillar is going to become the butterfly. Can I hear an amen? How many are excited about the Lord? So really when you're carrying your cross, it's a beginning and not an ending. <laughs> Hallelujah. Because you're going to resurrect in the midst of your suffering. Can I hear an amen? Hallelujah. What does the cross mean then for my future? The cross means this. He takes me to my cross so I can die and resurrect and become what he's truly created me to be. Cindy, can you give us 2 Corinthians 5.17 on the screen, please? Church, I want us to see this. 2 Corinthians 5.17. I want you to leave today getting this. It's so important in the Lord. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. Cindy, what does that look like in the Amplified? Therefore, if any person is engrafted in Christ, the Messiah... He is a new creation, a new creature altogether, metamorphosized. The old, the previous moral and spiritual condition has passed away. Behold, the fresh and the new has come. As he is, let us be in this world. As he is, let us be in this world. As he is, let us be in this world. Do you know why the enemy could never bring an end to the Apostle Paul? Until Paul surrendered to the beheading, which was the will of God for him. Because Paul was a walking dead man. Paul died many times that Christ might live through him. How did he die? He laid down his life. He laid down his will. He laid down his desire. He never died as in separation from God. He died as in he let the old life go behind him so he could be used by God in the now so that he could eventually graduate into eternity with him. There's birth, there's life, there's eternity. Every single one born on the earth will go through those three phases. Some will have eternal life, some will have true death. What does the Bible call that? The second death. <laughs> Folks, it's much better for you to go through the first death and not the second. What did Jesus say? He said, you'll either fall upon the rock and be broken or the rock will fall upon you and you'll be crushed. Lord, I'll take broken over crushed. Lord, I'll take the first death over the second. Come on. Lord, I'll be as you are on the earth. So this morning, you didn't get the tomb, you didn't get Mary Magdalene, you didn't get the angels, you didn't get the stone, but you got the resurrection message for the here and now. What is the Hebrew for resurrect? Rebirthed, revived, renewed, becoming upright. I don't know about you, but that's what God has for me today. 
No, wait a minute. I know about you. That's what God has for you today. Can I hear an amen? The Lord is saying, and I want you to grab a hold of this, whether you're in the sanctuary or, or you're listening by Ustream or YouTube. The Lord is saying this. Today is a new beginning. Remember the Lord told me at the during praise and worship, he showed me the menorah. He said the six branches are man. The middle branch is him. Man plus God is seven complete. But then the Lord says you add the resurrection and that's eight and eight is a new beginning. God is saying he has a new beginning for everybody that's hearing this word. But his beginning is an ending for you. It's an ending of your life, your mess, your struggles, your dreams, everything you wanted. He's saying, will you lay them down and die with him? Transition to a new dimension so that you can truly live. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. How many are willing? How many are willing? I want you to do this, and Rob, I'm going to ask you to turn off the lights. And Cindy, we can keep the, the folks online with us through part of this. Hallelujah. I want everybody, whether you are here in the sanctuary or you're listening to this message elsewhere, I want you in a really non-traditional, non-religious way just to close your eyes. And I want us all together to take before the throne of God everything that we've heard in this message today. Is there anybody listening that's been stuck in the womb? Is there anybody listening that's stuck in a previous season? Is there anybody here who knows that God is calling you to the more, but you just seem stuck. That stuckness is not on God's part. It's on your part. And God begins to deal with the stuckness through surrender. So I want to encourage you, if you're stuck today, to surrender to him. Maybe it's your will. Maybe it's your stubbornness. Maybe it's what you want. Whatever it is, I want you to surrender that to God. Somebody gave me a prophetic word a couple weeks ago. It said, Pastor, the church can't go farther than what you go. It's a good word. Church, the Lord can't take the people connected to you farther than what you go. Are you a saint carrying the cross or are you a saint following drinking Starbucks? Well, what, what are we today? We've got to get this settled before the Lord. So I'm going to ask Cindy just to put something on quiet for just a moment. And let's just take a few moments before the Lord, whether you are here in the sanctuary or listening online. And if you're online, don't tune out right now. But let the Spirit of God enter the room that you're in. And let the Spirit of God work as the Spirit of God is working right here in this place. Holy Spirit, we surrender to you right now. And Lord, in these few moments that we're going to take in your presence, God. God, I ask that you would speak to us about the season that we're in. And about the season that we're going to. Birth. Life. Eternity. Eternity is either eternal life or eternal death. If there's anyone that hears this word today and you don't know Jesus. Jesus says all you have to do is ask him to come into your life right now to forgive you of your sin and to fill you with his presence and he'll come in 
He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Anyone who opens the door, I will come in and I will sup with him. I will eat. I will dine with him. If you're in the season and you're stuck, it's a great time to say, Lord, this thing that you've been asking me for, I surrender it to you. And I let it go. Forgive me for holding on to it. Or if you're so excited about the next season that you're kind of here but you're not in this season, it's time to say, Lord, I surrender to what you want to do in this season. And I refuse to rush on to the next. I'm not going to go to the next until the labor pains start. And the water breaks. And you've changed me for the next season. Lord, I'm not moving until this tadpole sprouts little feet and the tail disappears. And a whole new thought process begins to take place. Metamorphosis. Metamorphosis. Eternity. Resurrection. Lord Jesus, I just ask right now, once again, God, that even as you're moving in the sanctuary, that you'll move in the homes of those that are listening. Lord, may this Easter end up being someone's spiritual birthday in a time of great change. Lord, have your way. And Lord Jesus, we pray these things now in your precious name. And everybody said, Amen. Before we go into communion, we're going to bring an end to uh, the online portion of our service. So now in the name of Jesus over everybody that's been listening online, I just pray may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord turn his countenance towards you and fill you with shalom peace. Nothing missing, nothing broken. In Jesus' name, God bless you. Have a wonderful rest of your Resurrection Sunday. Hallelujah.